We are back, Lars Fredrickson, myself. We are welcoming Jeff Jarrett back on the podcast, his uh, official second appearance. Uh, he was here. He was actually the Wrestling Perspective's very first ever guest. It was between the time he was nominated or announced he was going in WWE Hall of Fame and right before the actual inducting being inducted in so Lars this is your first time interviewing him my second time and it's his first time meeting me so yeah How about, go ahead no 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 looking forward to it so that would have been between January and April of 2018 yep. my how time flies and here we are February so five years later so Lars how are you doing today my friend I'm good buddy I'm really good I'm happy that you're here uh you know you're one of these one of these guys over the years that I've followed your career from the you know as maybe you do know maybe you don't know but I'm an old wrestling tape trader and so you know, following your career from the time that you stepped in the ring for the around the first couple of times. I've watched you. I've watched you grow. So I'm just happy and stoked that we're both here at the same time. And uh, welcome to the show, Mr. Jeff Jarrett. Thank you very much. Uh, Lars, I appreciate that. I had no idea that you were a tape trader. So there is a, uh, I'll just say this, there's kind of a special DNA uh, of a tape trader because it takes it to a whole nother level. I, I, obviously, with my um I guess you could say my, my, my family business, if you will, I, I would, I could always remember getting to see tapes that my dad would have way, way back in the day from different things. And JJ Dillon, uh, would, would send up tapes, uh, when he managed Kamala in the early eighties. So I was what, 10, 12, 14 years old, but I would always, I was a big magazine guy cause my dad always got the magazine. So I followed things at a really young age, uh, th through magazines. I wasn't, you know, I guess I, I wouldn't, and then I got into the business and I wasn't trading tapes, but, uh, uh, Jim Cornette, uh, was the, uh, the, the first in-depth conversation I had way, way back in the day before I ever broke in. And he had just broke in about actual trading tapes. And you just hear about, wow. So you've actually got a VHS tape of Japan wrestling. That's well, pretty, that just that kind of stuff. Well, you know, but that's the thing. It's like, for me, the magazines were always first. And I, you know, I grew up in California. So, you know, you would get a lot of the promotions. You got the AWA, you got the WWF, you got big time wrestling, you know, you got Polynesian Pacific Championship Wrestling. You know, you would obviously get the Lucha stuff on, you know, the VHF channels, you know, before cable TV. And then, uh, you know, the magazines, obviously you would be able to follow what was happening, who the sheep herders were, who Hacksaw Jim Duggan was. <laughs> You That's know, who, cool. you know, who DiBiase was, the New Orleans stuff that, you know, Louisiana stuff. And then, you know, and then I would just just consume it, consume it. And then when the when, when the VCR and the tape trading stuff and, and understanding that there was a whole other thing like Rollerball Rocco and and Jumbo <laughs> Saruta and, you know, and you would get all these tapes and, you know, see all these matches that in a million years being, you know, an American kid, you never thought you would ever have. So you know, and then you would do these bigger, deeper dives, you know, you would find other guys in different areas of the country and you could get the continental stuff. You could get the Memphis stuff. You could get the Florida stuff, blah, 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 blah. Because obviously, you know, when WTBS happened, it sort of knocked down the, the walls and you could see guys like Magnum TA and, and, you know, Ric Flair on the weekly basis and, you know, you know, whatever, but I digress. Dennis, I, Dennis normally uh, starts us off with the first question. I love this kind of conversation because, uh, sorry to cut you off there, no, no, but no. it's, it's one, to me, it's one of those things we've been around a few years, but you can have conversations, um, even some guys in their twenties and thirties that, that know enough about the territory days. And, you know, in my case, obviously there's always got to be a Memphis story, but even if it's, if it's, you know, Otto wines, Germany, just all the different areas around the world, it's one of those things that I've often said, if you know, you know, it's one of those things. If you don't, you have no context and, and you, you, you know, you were introduced to the business and the attitude era and which is great. It brought a ton of new fans in, of course. but, but a lot of folks that they, they, they can't even contextualize. Oh, wait, wrestling actually existed before raw and nitro. And <laughs> you, you know, that they, they just don't have that context. So that's why I'll often say, if you know, you know, yeah, <laughs> so Dennis, enough. Me and Lars took over the first eight <laughs> minutes. Would you like to join in on your show? I, I went to lunch. I just got back, guys. What are we talking about? <laughs> Thanks for the invite. Okay. Yeah. But, you you know, you, you've you been around a while, and you were one of those guys that it seemed like just recently before you started your podcast where 
people in the industry and fans seem not to let you off the hook for things that have happened in the past or other things that they've heard through the grapevine. Now that you've got this podcast, My World with Jeff Jarrett, which I'm a fan of, it seems like a lot of that online hatred for Jeff Jarrett is slowly melting away. And I know you're one of those guys that probably doesn't give a rat's ass of what uh, the majority of the online wrestling fans think of you. But is this kind of a, a change for you where you're kind of enjoying this now where fans might be a little bit more friendly towards you? I've got kind of a different slant on this. You know, Conrad Thompson, my partner, uh, said it really from day one. Jeff, people just don't know their story. And when they don't know their story, they really don't have a clue about who you are, uh, you know, the, the personal side of you or the family side of you, or maybe even the business side of you. They just see you as whether it's, Double J, Jeff Jarrett, or, you know, he laughs and cuts up simply irresistible or chosen one, whatever moniker, king of the mountain, whatever you want to throw in here, they just kind of know you from that slant. Um, the thing that I, I've, I've used to have this conversation with Conrad and I've had with others, I, I got lucky, blessed, cursed, however you want to cache it, but friend of, of a really early age. I mean, when I got into the business uh, and I actually started refereeing first. So, you know, whether it's refereeing or, or the first, I don't know, 12, 18 months of the business, I, you know, I'd go to the ring and get up in the ring and look, there's always boo birds and there would be boys, men, young men in the audience that just would cuss me out, call me everything under the sun. I mean, just like come unglued because maybe their girlfriend was cheering for me or, or whatever it may be. But those same guys that were on the front row or the back row or whatever, be yelling at me, they would be the ones in the parking lot wanting my autograph first. So to have kind of that context that, look, people will say one thing, but in reality, it's just human nature. So I've, I've kind of got a crash course, uh, whether it's a college education, a PhD, or maybe that, that uh, school of hard knocks kind of education, just on human nature that people love to, they believe what they want to believe, regardless of the truth. That's kind of the nature, not just of a wrestling fan and, and all of that. So I've always taken things somewhat with a grain of salt. I do find it fascinating launching the podcast, kind of back to your point, launching the podcast. And they're like, I had no idea Jeff did this, this, or this. I had no idea the, his viewpoint. And, you know, uh, I'll see often on Twitter. I used to hate, I grew up hating Jeff Jared. I hate, and I'm thinking, Yes, that was kind of by design, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it, it is fascinating. In the world we live in, social media, uh, God bless it. A lot of people get irritated at it, but I think you have to have a good perspective on it. I think it's a huge, a enormous asset, not just wrestling, any form of entertainment. It is a way to connect with the audience instantaneously, and it can go 24 7, 365. We didn't have that as we were, you know, talk, talking earlier. Back in the tape trading days, I used to have three to five minutes on Saturday morning at Memphis TV that would bicycle around. That was really my only exposure to the, to the fan base and then go wrestle live. And you didn't have any personal now social media. I'm at the gym, go Instagram live or whatever it may be. I can connect with the fan base instantly. That's huge. Well, you know, we're, I think we're roughly around the same age and we're, we're you short 29 too, Lars. I'm 27, so maybe you got me beat by Oh, my gosh, I'm the old guy in the room. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I feel like we're, you know, we're kind of like that weird generation where we're, we started performing pre-cell phone, pre-social media, but then our careers obviously took us into the world that we're living in now. Um, mm -hmm. As far as, like, you know, the way that you've approached the business over the years – you know, there's obviously a before and after because once now everything that we do, it can be instantaneously uploaded and seen by millions. And not only that, but there's people who will post things three hours before it happens. For example, like TV, like Monday Night Raw will obviously be on the East Coast before it hits me on the West Coast. But my question, I guess, is, is how much of that psychology um, in today's wrestling do you still like, so, you know, from the past, how much of that past psychology can we bring in the modern day wrestling in your opinion? Cause you're, you're still doing it. So, you know, how much of that past Jeff Jarrett, what you learned from at the very beginning before there was all this, do you bring in the current state? 
Oh boy, that is a loaded question. I could really, really talk a long time of that because I think it that is uh, a very, or for lack of a better word, I can't really come. It's a very intellectual question because it's a thinking man's. You you have to kind of think through that. Uh, I broke into the business in '86, and so it was live in Memphis, Tennessee, and so the people saw it there live, and they got to see whatever happened on Saturday morning. Go down Monday night and watch the the, the payoff for the match. Well, that same action that happened on that Saturday morning, we took that tape. And seven days later, that following Saturday morning in Nashville, Louisville, Evansville. So it's all new to, you know, it's 200 miles up the road, but, but they got to see it for the first time on Saturday morning. Uh, and then, you know, in Nashville's case, eight hours later, we would have the matches in Nashville Saturday night. So in Louisville on Tuesday night. So the, I guess you could say kind of the time jump and, and having that emotional feel you're talking about an East coast, West coast. And, you know, when we started TNA, um, there, there were some, uh, networks. And this isn't that long ago that took episode one, uh, when we had been in business 60, 70 weeks. So, but they go back to episode one. So just kind of, uh, more than anything, Lars, I think it really taught me that at the end of the day, you know, it's professional wrestling and that equals sports entertainment, but obviously we're not true sport, but, but, you know, we lean into that entertainment where, you know, you can shoot a movie and it doesn't air for two years from now. So episodically speaking that we are really telling a story. And if you don't have a simplistic story in our business, no matter how long the time is it, 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 it to me, it's real, really, really about storytelling. It's not so much about although the the false finishes and the ins and outs but every match is a story in your business music you you know you you can you can be the best instrumentalist and everything that goes with it but if it's not really laid out in in i call it a story a song but yeah what we are is storytellers and i think that goes with uh so many forms of of business not just entertainment you know if you're selling mortgages like conrad it's still a story uh, if you're whatever it may be so t taking what you said you know taken from my past w w at the end of the day we're storytellers and i think a lot of times today Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, people want instantaneous information and they can turn on a dime because this journalist said this and this journalist said that. And all of a sudden this guy assumed this, which is totally off base. And you hear a bunch of noise. I think a lot of noise can be created in our business about nothing, uh, speculation and everybody dials into that. But I think as talent, as promoters, as producers, you kind of have to reel that back in and say, stay true to your story. Cause ultimately that's really what makes our world go around. Yeah. That makes sense, Lars. I know that. that I would, yeah. We're yeah. storytellers. I, no, I, and I 100% agree. And I'm sorry, Dennis, but let me just follow up with this just real quick. It's like, so, I mean, because Bill Apter, Pro Wrestling Illustrated, used to help you with the story and talk to the wrestlers and say, okay, I want to print a story about you and we're going to further this along in the magazines. Now, you know, you have you know, wrestling dirt sheets and, 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 and online website storytellers, you know, and maybe some of even the wrestlers help them spill the story. Right. But now it's like such an instantaneous thing. Like you said, where do you, where, 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 in your opinion is the, is the suspension of disbelief where, where, where as a fan or even as a wrestler, how do you, because that, that, that information is so instantaneous these days, how do you suspend that disbelief? into the actual story that you're trying to tell. Well, um, I think the most recent example would be, um, Jeff Jarrett, Sanjay Dutt, Jay Lethal, Satnam Singh versus the acclaim. There were some blurred lines in there. Reality based truth in reality has always been, I don't know if you guys saw that tales of the territory episode, you know, in my, Jerry Lawler and, and my father, Jerry Jarrett, you know, in their business office and it goes back and they're not the only ones and they didn't create this, but you know, personal issues draw money. And when you have a personal issue, it's gotta be reality based. And when you blur the lines and to this day, there's folks that are not real sure what all lines were blurred uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, but, but, but it, that, that is to me, if you're telling a story, if it's a hundred percent fiction, your audience knows it. It's to me, it's, it truly is that simple. So you got to blur the lines.
And without giving away what was blurred and what's not, because I don't want to know, I am one of those guys that truly enjoy not knowing it. And I don't read the dirt sheets. I don't read the new stuff. I just like the pure being surprised. How do you handle blurred lines in today's wrestling as as compared to yesterday's wrestling? That's a good question, because it, it, to say it's on a case-by-case -case basis would be an understatement. I almost think it's on a day-by-day -day basis, mm -hmm. that you, you, you're really going to have to um, – uh, uh, you got a vibe, you got to feel things. And I think that only comes with experience. And, you know, when you life experiences, uh, being a part of hundreds and hundreds, maybe thousands of angles, I have the context of, well, this worked and this didn't work and everything in between. And so kind of feeling things out and knowing again, you confuse them, you lose them. If, if you get too deep into a story and, and, and the, even the players in the story get confused. It's not going to work. Keep it simple. It's really the kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. Do you find that today's modern wrestling, because there's so much to consume, uh, in your opinion, do you think that there's too much out there and it's too much to process? That's a good question. Cause when uh, I just had this conversation this morning with, with some folks, uh, o over in the UK, um, and, and they're, they're not in the day-to-day -day wrestling, but we got into a deep discussion. And when you talk about three hours on Monday, two hours on Tuesday, two hours on Wednesday, um, two, <laughs> three hours on Friday, that's just the big two you throw in. I mean, we could you pick your bunch. I mean, there's so many other promotions that is a lot consumed. So as, as it will call it the casual fan, I believe the casual fan base is enormous and people will get into the discussion only the hardcores of this and that. Well, to me, each promotion kind of has to laser focus on, we're not going to worry about the chatter outside of us. We're going to stay in, in, not just in our lane, but cause you can, you can throw jabs here and there and cross reference all the different promotions. Cause I think if you have the mentality that you act like you're the only promotion and others don't exist, that doesn't work. But for lack of a better word, I, I think as each individual promotions, just stay true to, to your stories, your talent, your, your threads. And, um, if, if, if you, if you don't, then kind of what you're saying, you know, there's 30 other storylines going out there. Uh, so, you, you can really get caught up in, I call it, you know, you almost get caught in the washing machine where everything goes in one thing and n nothing really comes out clean. It's, it's all one big mess, but yeah, that's a tough question, Lars, because I think in our, 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 our world, we live in, um, our phones, man, you, we can watch every promotion anytime we want and go back to our tape drain days. So, uh, staying focused on your own stories is, uh, is a challenge in today's environment. Me knowing PD and uh, knowing that you both were in the same company in 2022, and it probably would have had to blow in your mind if you would have asked you a few years ago if you and PD Williams would be in the WWE at the same time. But you fast forward and knowing PD, and he says there are two people in his career that he he thinks more than anybody. It's you and Scott Demore, and you look back at the roster of people that you've put into a position today to be champions and main eventers on just about every TV program everywhere. And I don't think you get the credit that you deserve on the talent that you've brought forth into the wrestling career today. Is, is that something you still kind of keep your fingers in uh, evaluating young talent? Was it something you, you know, you even still take pride in today or because I, I have to imagine you shake your head sometimes and go, man, you know, I, I'm just more than Jeff Jarrett on TV guy. I've had this portion and these people are cut from the Jeff Jarrett talent tree. You know, I feel lucky, grateful, blessed, all the above. It's kind of the culture also that, that I was born and raised in. I mean, uh, the Tennessee territory, uh, socioeconomic, it, we couldn't compete with Charlotte or, or the WWWF just their dollars and cents. Texas was a lot bigger. So my father and Jerry Lawler and obviously their predecessors, they were always looking for new talent and developing new talent. And I, that whole entire learning tree was, 
you have to have a turnover of talent. You know, it was Lawler and Dundee and maybe Dutch, but a lot of talent came through road warriors, Hogan, Savage, you name it. They all came through Tennessee, but kind of the mindset of cultivating talent, uh, was in, in my D or is in my DNA. And it still is today in ways that would probably surprise you, but it, it's, it is part of who I am as far as a businessman is cultivating talent. But then you fast forward to 2002, June 19th, we launched TNA. We were the alternative at that time, you know, as Lars pointed out, there weren't cell phones and, or, you know, YouTube, it was pre social media, pre all that kind of instantaneous information. So we, you know, wet the, the, the internet was just kind of getting its legs under it in, in, in a big way. So we were the alternative. And so that culture that we created, um, you know, that early, early TNA crew was kind of small. And then we grew. And then as you know, team Canada and Joe, Samoa Joe and AJ Styles and beer money, just the development of talent through the years was something that was really a part of, of, of it always will be a part of my DNA. And I, I just kind of think as we progress along, I think the opportunities in 2023 to develop talent are more, they're out there more than ever. I mean, when I look back to, you know, on my 2022 year um, and I said it a year ago, this time, Effie is a really, really good talent. He took an ass quick and ass kicking from the last outlaw, but no, there is so much talent on the market right now that is, I'll say quote unquote, undiscovered. They're just looking for their opportunity. The opportunities are there because of the ability to monetize content. Nowadays, you can do it. Fight, uh, F I T E the streaming service. You know, there's just so many different ways that you can monetize things. Uh, us at AEW, I've never, ever seen a roster as deep as it is. I mean, you look and you can break it down through diversity. It's, you know, look, look at just, I'll just take, for example, cause they're near and dear to my heart because of my lineage or uh, my time spent in Mexico. Look at just the luchadors on the AEW roster. Then look at the female division. And then you, you, I mean, I could go on and on and on tag team division. It is super, super deep and there's still talent on the market. So it's really a cool time to be in the business. I'll say that, but, um, it's something that, that, that I guess is handed down from my dad as far as cultivate back to your question, answer your question, cultivating talent is something that, uh, is something I love and, and, and will always love. You know, after what you just said, I wanted to ask you another question, but I'm just going to ask the other question that I originally wanted to ask, <laughs> even though I'm going to try to store in TNA when it first came out, it was like a pay-per-view kind of thing. And I think you guys did around 60 episodes. If I'm, if I remember correctly, a weekly, we ended up doing, uh, it was gosh, uh, 104. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Was, okay. What did you think? But yeah, well, but then we went into Fox sports, but go ahead. Okay. So, and you know, it was 104 because I tape traded for them, but, okay. <laughs> uh, um, so my question to you is, is, um, coming right off the rip to the pay-per-view sort of, I guess, model, you know, with a new wrestling promotion, um, there must have been a lot of trepidation because, you know, it's a new company and not a lot of people maybe have no, would, would know about it or whatever. You know, when you walk into that kind of situation and you're thinking about the marketing and, and, and who to bring in for these shows, it seemed like you were bringing up a lot of these guys that were maybe more on the indie scene. Was that by design? Yeah, for sure. It, again, uh, I've always said that the mix uh, of the best roster is you just kind of have to have – vets and primetime players and up and comers and scene stealers and everything with it. But, you know, we had a run of the hacksaw, Jim Duggins, the road warriors, Rick Steiner. We, you know, it was what veteran is going to show up this week, but it, at that very core was developing independent talent. I mean, AJ styles was pre launch. We wanted him, uh, you know, and I could go down a, a list of other guys, Bobby rude. I can, I'll, I've said it on my podcast. I'll never forget be asking Scott more. Did you tell me this guy had a tryout at WWE or is going to No, he had one? I said, and they didn't sign him. He said, Nope. I'm like, we want him now. You know, just that whole mentality of us, we have to develop our core roster. It couldn't happen overnight. I knew it wouldn't happen overnight, but yes, I, I wanted to develop our brand of wrestlers. And that was that, you know, we launched the X division. We, I was very bullish on, uh, having diverse uh, styles, the luchadors. Uh, I wanted Japanese style. I wanted, you know, European style. But, but yeah, the, the independent market, again, uh, if you know, you know, 
the independent scene in 2002, 2003, 2004, compared to what it is now, it's not even in the same stratosphere. It's just, there is so much more work out there. Understand how much work is out there today versus that time frame. And guys that get into this industry, they got an ability to have, get their reps in. And, and I always, when they ask me, you know, advice or what do you think? And I'm like, man, go get as many reps. When I broke in, I got lucky. I was doing seven nights a week, day one. Nothing replaces reps. It just, it, it never will. Well, I mean, because it's interesting because I'm sorry, Dennis. It's but right. this, you know, <laughs> I, I saw AJ Styles and Smart Bart Sawyer at a NWA Outlaw show in Marietta, Georgia in like 1997. And, wow. then, ne and then next thing you know, like, here he is on your TV. So, um, and then, you know, guys like CM Punk, I mean, you, you basically had the who's who of professional wrestling, you know, on your shows at the very beginning, as far as the up and comers. So, you know, anyways, I digress, Dennis, sorry. Uh, you're pushing 40 years in, in wrestling and how, how can he do that at 27 years old? It's, well, it's, it's a time like travel. Don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, there you go. Thank you. Thank Time you. travel. <laughs> Lars, I'm going to sit you down and we're going to have to have the adult talk here in a little bit, bud. Uh, but <laughs> but you're, you're, you're pushing 40 years in wrestling, and I've been at my real job for 22 years, and I'm a crabby, unhappy son of a bitch at the end of 22 <laughs> years. How do you still do it? How do you even still want to do it? How you're You look better now than you have 10 years ago. And you're more popular now than it seems like you're more popular now than when you were the NWA champion. You you were having this, I guess, maybe an unseen renaissance in anybody's career. I don't know if there's a, can any of us name any wrestler that has had this sort of renaissance in his career now. Do you do you know what you attribute this to? Like, do you sit up at night and go, I don't get it, but here I am. Um. I'll, and I appreciate those comments. I sincerely do. And I'll, I'll try to make a, a, the most simple, uh, I don't think it's an answer. It's really just my response. Is it, let me ask you a question. Is it possible to have a peak, a mountaintop without a valley? It's really not. You, 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 there, there's no such thing as a mountaintop unless you have the valleys below it. Um, a little over five years ago, it's, well documented and some know and some don't know but i went through a really really dark time in my life um and during that time it, i think it gave me a great new perspective a new outlook uh i view things differently uh in a lot of a lot of ways you know i was i don't want to say off the market but you know i i wasn't active and 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 doing the things but you know, uh, over the last couple of years, it, and I've documented on my world, you know, from the Hall of Fame and then working in international and the live event department of WWE and doing certain things and just kind of my life circumstances, I just made a decision uh, about, I don't know, now it's 18 months ago that, you know what, I'm going to get in the best shape I possibly can and just see what happens. I had no plans. I had no uh, you know, game plan or other than today, I'm going to do everything in my power to be the best Jeff can be. And, uh, you know, uh, as of today, it's, it's working out. All right. I'm having a blast in the ring. If you would have told me, if I would have told you this time last year, we would all said, hey, what are you smoking? Are you out of your mind? But, um, uh, to me, the, the AEW situation and hats off uh, to Tony Khan. He's the one, it goes without saying, he green lit it. It's, you know, it's the Khan organization uh, and and he gr green lit the, 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 the situation. And so I always said definition of luck is when preparation meets opportunity. I feel like I was prepared. I stayed prepared. The opportunity came along um, and, and our relationships with our core group, me and Sanjay go back, uh, 20 something years, early days of TNA, me and Jay lethal, almost that long, uh, the Ric Flair's last match, you know, I was a, a part of that behind the scenes in front of the scenes. And, and it goes without saying the nature boy, there, there's only one nature boy and the timing of that and everything that went down and, and the records and, and just kind of that entire weekend, it's kind of been, uh, just 2022 was, um, just, just the timing of everything to, for me to get the opportunity to go from game changer to the NWA to, um, SummerSlam, you know, as far as 
you know, being a part of that to Ric Flair's last match. And then, you know, the sting situation for me and sting to step in the ring in 2022 and the history that we've had that went back 25 years, that was surreal. So I, I can't put my thumb on it other than, um, it sounds old cliche ish, but if, 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 and I, uh, this is a words of advice that I'm talking to myself more than anybody get up every day and literally put your best effort be the very best you can for that day. Good things are going to happen. You know, I feel like we hit a certain age in our lives and we let bygones be bygones, but we also have these minds for what we do. And I know that you have an incredible mind for professional wrestling. You know, I've produced records, you know, I've done these things. And sometimes in, at certain points of my lifetime, it was, was, was very hard for me not to give my opinion. And it sounds like through your process where you're at now, you sort of realize that sometimes it's better to sit there and look stupid than open your mouth and say something stupid, right? So uh, you please feel free to borrow that if you want. Um, I, I you will. Know, but, uh, well, you do it all the time, friend. So, you know, that's where I came up with it. But <laughs> my, my <laughs> I guess my point is, is like, you know, you've been – with every single company and you sort of have a really good idea how things should work. Is it hard for you at this point in your life, even with all this, this, this sort of introspection that you've done this dark time that you went through, is it still hard? Is it hard for you to keep your trap shut or, 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 or do you sit there and just, just say, well, you know what? They're going to figure it out. My friend, I think me and you both can relate to this experiences. If you really focus on learning from your experiences. And I went a lot of years that had a lot of experiences and, and I'd never stopped to process and say, what can I learn from that? And now what role did I have in either making that a success or a failure? Probably more importantly as a failure, you know, what our ego likes to tell us is if it went great, I get all the credit. If it went bad, somebody else screwed up. It's really the opposite. You know, what is my role in it? And I just think with those experiences come wisdom. And when you begin to, to really process things and get a little bit wiser and a little bit wiser, you learn to understand for the most part, if somebody comes to you and ask advice, it's a completely different set of circumstances other than if you walk into a situation and say, Hey folks, let me tell you what you're doing wrong. AB. It never works, never yeah. works. So a guy that comes up to me or whatever, if somebody's wants to engage, I'm more than willing to ask, uh, uh, ask questions first, then give some advice. I don't ever give advice without kind of understanding more of the situation, but experience says that I'm a better father that way. It, it's just, it, look, I, I was, I was a hellion as a kid. I raised hell. <laughs> Well, <laughs> you know, but my parents were divorced, but I put both of them through hell. And, and, and as I look back on things, it's it, at the end of the day, we want to do it our way. And, you know, life is just that way. You just kind of have to have some experiences. You got to have to have some failures, learn from those failures, pick yourself up. But, um, Lars, you said it well, it, it takes real wisdom to just keep your mouth freaking shut and just let things happen because a lot of times, like you said, they'll end up coming back around and saying, Hey, what do you think? And then they've got some experience under their belt of things not going right. Then they're much more open to learning. I know we've got to wrap this podcast up and Lars and I each have one more question. And I've always wanted to ask someone this is, is one of the old school guys, maybe even a gatekeeper of the industry before they let anybody in, you had to pass our no wrestler and he had to give you the green light. And then maybe you could get into the industry. We're in this new age where there's media scrums. Everybody has podcasts and you be an old school guy where you had to keep your mouth shut. Secrets were secrets. People got kicked out of the industry for talking. Now, here we are with podcasts and you're telling stories. Is there ever a part of you that feels conflicted? Like maybe uh, even though the doors blow wide open on the wrestling industry that boy, you know, part of me it was raised not to talk about this. And here I am talking about this. 
Um, man, I, I got a couple of different ways to take this, but it's almost like, you know, do you really want to spit in the wind? Are you really going to fight progress? Are you really going to try to pay, uh, the basketball analogy? Do you really want to go out and run a, an offense on basketball and act like a three point line doesn't exist? If you do, you're going to get your brains beat out because they go down to the other court and the other guys, they're bombing threes and scoring. And so all of a sudden they're getting three points for every time they score, you're getting two. It doesn't work. So, uh, you know, we can choose to fight the evolving times or not. But what has become a real revelation, and I don't know if I'm going to articulate this right, is that the more and more people think they understand and know the business, for me, and I keep my mouth shut, but it's more and more and more and more and more and more, and did I say more and more, a enormous red light that they don't know what in the hell they're talking about. Yeah, they just don't. So, so yeah, I mean that 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 and, and I'm not saying just journalists. It can be talent, journalists, whatever. When you think when they think they've really got it all figured out, they just they just don't because there's a few things in this business that only experience teaches you. And at the very end of it, and that's something that you know, the last outlaw, you know, I'll say double J. King of the mountain, chosen one. We're, in a lot of ways, we're all extensions of my personality. The last outlaw is without question an extension of my personality. And, and I'm going back to what Lars said, you know, just keeping your mouth shut because most of the time folks will flap their gums. They'll be a slappy. And then you know exactly how to checkmate them. I guess if I had a last question, you know, I always come from this place of like, what am I, what have I experienced you know, because I think we try to find the humanity, you know, as pro wrestling fans on this podcast. Knowing what you've gone through, is there a certain uh, is there a certain amends for you to a person, place, thing, whatever it is that still needs to be to that still needs to happen? As far as all your years, all your time, all your mistakes, all your triumphs, failures, whatever. We, no one win, learns anything by winning. We all know that. But is there an amends that you still need to make? You know what? It's 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 a word that that uh, is often spoke spoke in. We can call it recovery or however you want to cash it. it. But to me, it's really in life. It's that living amends mm -hmm. that that I can talk is cheap. Actions speak so much. It's a total understanding. Actions should speak louder than words. But it's that living amends. And if I do the next right thing day in day out, and I mean you know, characters define when you do the right thing, when nobody's looking. And so that, that to me is in the, the, the real DNA of who I am, that, that no matter who I'm dealing with, if I'm dealing with, a, you know, a, an audio grip on a set, don't disrespect him. If I'm dealing with the boss, the boss's boss, the boss's boss, you got to have respect. You, you got to have that integrity all day, every day. And that living amends of being the person that, that, you know, I don't want to be, who I am today, tomorrow, I want to get a little bit better and a little bit better. That to me is, is the amends that I live because I went for so many years in this industry. It, it's just kind of the nature of the beast and entertainment, you know, me, 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 grab, grab, grab. It's all about me. It's all about me. You go, the world's going to revolve around me. And that takes you to death. Uh, you know, maybe not physical death, but certainly emotional and spiritual uh, and mental death. But, but that living amends is how I live my life. Anytime I hear about you from PD, he calls you Uncle Jeff. One day, maybe <laughs> Lars and I will be able to call you Uncle Jeff. Anytime. But I've got one last request before we send you on your way. Will you please call Lars Fredrickson slap nuts for me? Because I can't talk trash to him. He's way more famous than I am. You are way more famous than he is. Just for me. Just no, for no, no, no. I, re I can't respect Lars. I can't call slap ass Lars a slap nut. <laughs> that wouldn't be fair. You have to call him a slap ass. It's much more dignified. There you go. He's got the double J up. See, that's what I'm saying. <clears throat> you, uh, I mean, I just got slap nuts and slapped ass from double J. <laughs> there you go. I love it. But see, my guitars are real though, bro. <laughs> I, don't, I, won't, I won't know part of your guitars. Trust me. Uh, my World Podcast, go out, watch it. AEW Wednesday nights, check your local listings for times. Jeff Jarrett, thank you so much for coming back on this podcast. Almost five years to the day that you were on last time. That time flies. Hey, guys, I'll get aside. I'm glad we got this schedule, we got to do it. Uh, enjoy life, folks. We only get to live it once. Thank you so much.